Hello everybody, my name is Eric, and today we're going to be taking a look, and I'm going to be talking about Windows Sandbox, because this has been a very requested topic. Now this is similar to my Can Malware Escape VMs video, but this is specifically about a function called the Windows Sandbox. Now the Windows Sandbox is fundamentally a Hyper-V VM, but there's a couple of tricks they've used that make it more convenient. I actually made a video showing it off back in 2021. I'll include a link to that for a general overview of the product, but in terms of its security, we'll go over that. So Windows Sandbox provides a lightweight desktop environment to safely run applications in isolation. Software installed inside the Windows Sandbox environment remain sandboxed and run separately from the host. A sandbox is temporary. That means the data is not st saved. So there's no VM file. So if your computer reboots, uh, you're not going to keep the data. However, you can reboot the VM. You cannot access software or files from the host, though it is part of Windows. There's no need to download a VHD. It's pristine. Yes, it's disposable. Now, here's what Microsoft has to say on its security. It uses hardware-based virtualization and the Microsoft hypervisor. Now, what I find super cool about Windows Sandbox, I've actually used it in a few of my videos when I don't need any of my more advanced tools and I happen to be booted into Windows. This is great because uh, everything is set up and it has this GPU partitioning. And unlike Hyper-V, where the viewer for some arbitrary silly reason is capped at 1080p, it can go to any resolution your monitor can. So it's a pretty good tool, and you need Windows Pro, Enterprise, or Education in order to use this. So then, the hypervisor under the hood is actually just Hyper-V, which is Microsoft's hypervisor, which has had, compared to, let's say, VirtualBox, a very good security history. I will in just a second go over the CVEs, because there have been a couple of exceptions to that. The biggest risk, and this is not just for people who don't know what they're doing, I have come within, they, I have come dangerously close to making this mistake. And it's actually, because one comment I get is, why don't I use dunk mode on my videos? There's two reasons. One of them is because light mode is better for accessibility, especially people who have an eye condition called astigmatism can easily read uh, light mode. And generally you can read light mode at a smaller size than you can dunk. The second reason is because when I, whenever I am using um, Windows or something, uh, the same operating system on the host, I will use donk mode on the host and light mode in the guest, and that way makes it easier not to make that mistake. So that is the biggest problem. When you're doing Windows malware analysis on Windows, you are playing with fire because it's really easy, especially if you're using a VM in a window, uh, you click somewhere else, or what happened with me, and luckily it was just looking at a folder, it wasn't executing anything, I did Windows key all, and I thought I was in the VM, I was on the host, and luckily I was just looking at my app data and couldn't figure out why I couldn't find the payload. So that's a big risk. User error. Only needs to happen once to create a real disaster. Now in terms of escape vulnerabilities, well Hyper-V has had a few, although relatively fewer. So most of these are irrelevant. Denial of service and most can crash the host. That doesn't hugely matter. This one isn't that bad, but then there's a few elevation of privilege. The worst one is this one. This was a full-blown remote code execution. What that would mean is on the host, the computer that is running Hyper-V, you could execute code from the guest. Attack vector is local, uh, complexity low, privileges required low, no interaction, and high integrity and availability. Now there is no publicly available exploit, but there is an available fix. There is also another one that was briefly seen in the real world. There was a method in Hyper-V's network switch, vmswitch.sys, that affected hordes of versions of Windows Server. Now what it could do is a certain value that went to the switch was not validated, which meant the right packet could be exploited to gain privileges on the host, and all you had to be able to do was send a specially crafted packet. So you didn't need to be root, you didn't need kernel privileges. So this was a terrible vulnerability. Now it was fixed. The biggest concern about this vulnerability was that in server use cases, because servers are not frequently rebooted, they may not be getting security updates all the time. And as a result, this could still exist. Not been that many of these compared to other things. And then there's uh, an unproven uh, vulnerability in 2024. 
And then the other major source of trouble, and of course the virtual GPU implementation used now is different, uh, but if we go way, way back, for the current system, there was something called Remote FX, which was much like I said in the previous uh, VM Escape video, Remote FX was a GPU emulation feature where it basically translated guest graphics APIs to the host. And if there was any sort of mistake made within such a design, it could be a disaster. And there are a bunch of these. Uh, these ones worked in conjunction with an AMD graphics driver, and we can uh, control F this, and we can just see piles of remote effects, security vulnerabilities. Microsoft ultimately decided that making remote effects secure was more difficult than completely getting rid of it, so they, they don't support remote effects anymore. Now here is a Microsoft article on uh, GPU virtualization that explains why is this okay but remote FX wasn't. Now you can also, if you do f want to maximize security and avoid the risk of a potentially uh, an escape from the virtualized GPU, you actually can using group policy edit or disable this. You can do this if we go to gpedit uh, .msc of course. Computer Configuration Administrator Templates, Windows Components, here we go. So we can enable this or we can disable this. And it would use software rendering, which is slower, but it could potentially uh, make things different. You also have the ability to set these isolation settings. Now this one I would very strongly recommend turning off, because clipboard sharing can be a massive source of problems, and if you have a clipper running in the guest, that's not great. Audio input, probably fine. Mapping, this one might be useful, and you can also change it to allow it to map to folders, allow networking. Some people say they don't allow their VM to network. Testing most malware of interest is going to need networking, but yes, if you have something that doesn't, turning this off could give you a bit of extra security. This one I would disable because I don't think you're going to, I can't imagine why you would ever want a printer in a VM. And this would be for a webcam. No good reason to ever give that to a VM. So the overall conclusion then. Yes, Windows Sandbox is safe. The biggest danger is going to be user error. It is remarkably unlikely that you'll find a sample that is intended to bypass Windows Sandbox, other than just by refusing to run in Windows Sandbox, which will happen because it's easy to test. You can just look for WDAG user and you can just refuse to run in there, problem solved. That will happen. Otherwise, escapes are not that likely. I would personally recommend always doing malware analysis, especially with malware you think is dangerous, on a separate system that ideally doesn't run Windows just for the sake of not running it on the same operating system and being very careful. The biggest risk remains, just like the other video I made, user error. Now if you want to see how to set up a more advanced GPU pass-through setup, like the setup that I'm using to record this and most of my videos, please do subscribe because the guide will actually be coming out in a few days. So that's all for me for now. Bye!